Uh, hello, okay. everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Juan Antonio, and we're going to start. Hopefully, you're here because you're interested in compliance, in OpenShift, automation. If not, you're still welcome to stay. But I understand if you got here by mistake, that's also not an issue. It happens. So we got a pretty big agenda uh, for the limited time that we have. But we're going to go through it. and. Uh, It'll be fine. Hopefully, we're going to answer these questions. If not, there is still a Q&A uh, time slot enabled. So it'll be fine. So first, a quick introduction about who are we? Who are these weird people that are talking to you? Uh, my name is Juan Antonio Soros Robles, but that's pretty long, so you can call me Oz. I'm a Mexican living in Finland, and nowadays I do OpenShift, uh, mostly security and compliance, though. So that's who I am. I'm Jakub Rosek. I'm working on OpenShift security and compliance with OS. And before I was work, before I started working on this project, I used to work for a long time on SSD and free IPA. All right. Uh, so now we're just going to go very quickly about why we're even doing what we're doing. So Jakub. All right. So the work we are doing is making sure that OpenShift is able to pass uh, compliance test. Compliance is compliant. And we're doing this because unless a piece of software is compliant, it can't be used in some industries or environments. Think banks, uh, militaries, governments, like that. Our biggest user or customer, whatever you want to take it, is the North American public sector. Uh, this has implication on what standards we are trying to be compliant with first. Um, and while we are doing this software work and automating the stuff, in theory, you can just download the standard and go to the cluster and make it compliant yourself. But that's already quite hard work if you're doing it with like with one machine, one VM, one server. If you bring this up on the cluster scale, it becomes even harder. And uh, with OpenShift, you're not just trying to make the Kubernetes layer compliant, just the, uh, just the cluster level. But under that, you have nodes that the cluster runs on. And underneath, you also have other layers that we don't necessarily care with our software, with the compliance operator. Like you might need to make sure that actually the hardware you're running on is compliant or that the people who are operating the, the cluster pass some background checks and whatnot. That's outside our jurisdiction. But the point is to make sure the whole system is compliant is very hard. And it gets much harder uh, with the cluster. And what makes it even harder is that Kubernetes is an upstream project and OpenShift as a product are very uh, fast moving. And the standards that you are complying with are quite big. So if you are doing this all this all work manually, once you are done, the next version comes and you can as well start over. So it's kind of prudent that the compliance work is done in uh, automated fashion, and uh, if possible with a with a click of a button. And the last thing is that the standards themselves, while they are often freely accessible, you can just download them and process them yourself. They are not easy to read. They are written in sort of lawyer English. And you need to go from that to some configuration directives. And it's not easy to, to process the standard and figure out how do, I, how do I go from the sentence in the standard to some configuration settings on my cluster. And this is all done automatically by the uh, compliance operator and the compliance as code project. Okay, next slide, please. So the, the team we are part of is called uh, Infrastructure Security and Compliance. That's me and us and another developer, Matt Rogers, who I'm not sure if he's there, but he's not presenting. Uh, what we do is we, uh, on one level, we go through the standards, the compliance controls, and try to codify them as compliance content that can be then evaluated and automated by the compliance operator. The compliance operator is another big part of what we are doing. So it's a it's an OpenShift operator that 
can run in your cluster, can take the compliance content, evaluate it, and based on the content, tell you if you are con compliant, how much you are compliant, and help you with mitigating any issues that uh, you might have. As I said earlier, a big part of what we do is for the North American public sector. So the standard that we start with is called federal moderate. There's also kind of acronym that is known, of, known by NIST 853. Uh, it's not all that we are doing, but we are starting with that because all the other standards, even outside North America, like Australian E8 and whatever else might be used around the world, is sort of based on those standards. So it's not like we are just doing the NA public sector work, and then we're going to start over and do something completely different. The other standards are based on that. So uh, if we start with the FedRAM standards, we will be covering sort of implicitly the other work. Um, except for the compliance operator that we will talk about in detail in this presentation, we are also working on another operator for um, file integrity of the cluster nodes. Uh, that's called file integrity operator. It's not mentioned very much in this talk, or I think not even at all, but it's also a cool project and you can check it out if you're interested. Next slide, please. Okay, in the, in the oh, following slides, that, we'll... Uh, you're talking about? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Right, uh, so now we're going to talk a little bit about what we actually did, which is the whole reason of this talk. And uh, so as folks might know, there is this cool new thing in OpenShift or, well, in Kubernetes in general called operators. So uh, to some extent, we did develop uh, a lot of the stuff for the operator to be able to do scans in the cluster in a more automated and friendly fashion. However, we didn't, uh, we can't take credit for everything, right? So I'm just gonna mention that there are three big pieces to all of this work, right? The first one, of course, is the operator. And the operator is a controller that uh, listens for specific objects and uh, helps you get into compliance, structure compliance, and then uh, will give you guidance on how to reach there if there are any gaps, right? Uh, then we have OpenSCAP, which is a tool that we use to actually do the checks. And that is a NIST certified tool in order to uh, follow policies, code them into uh, a language called SCAP, actually, and evaluate it, right? So this is a long, well, it has a long history uh, of a project. And um, so we can't take credit for that one, but we work closely with those folks. That's a great team as well. And finally, of course, what is a compliance tool without content, right? You want to do checks and you want to give explanations about what you're checking. So that is what the content does, right? There is a project called Compliance as Code where you are able to write content for different platforms and uh, this is what we took into use, right? Uh, so getting back to the operator, we expose a lot of custom resources in order to be uh, help you automate your compliance story. Uh, it looks very overwhelming and it kind of is, but don't worry, there is a subset that you could care about, right? And we'll go through them in a little bit, so you don't need to worry about that either. Uh, the first thing that you want to do though, when you're trying to reach compliance or evaluate for compliance is figure out, hey, what am I going to comply with and how am I going to do it? Uh, and so this is the first step and the first thing that you're going to have to define. It's actually the only thing that you as a user need to choose, pick and choose, right, for your cluster. So the first thing, of course, is a profile, right? A profile is a definition of a benchmark, so to say, and it, it contains a list of rules, right? So for the for this use case, for example, is we're choosing the Essential 8 benchmark, uh, and it contains the appropriate descriptions, um, some metadata about what it applies for, and um, Ultimately, what you're going to do is check a specific set of rules, right? So they're defined over there. Uh, after that, you have a rule, and the rule defines what specifically are you going to check, uh, which is the most granular thing, right? So it could be that you're going to check file permissions. It could be that you're going to check for a kernel argument. There's many things that could be done. So that would be the rule. And rules are included in profiles, as I mentioned. Uh, for example, in this case, we also include a description of the rule to help you audit what you're doing, 
right? So you have some, uh, more metadata such as severity, even a warning. Uh, and so in the final report, you can see all of this stuff, right? Uh, and of course, uh, a big thing is how do I fix this, right? And in this case, this is a machine config object, which is an OpenShift specific object that allows you to configure the operating system. So uh, this is included as part of the rule, right? So as part of this rule, if I find an issue, this is how I fix it. So all of this information is there. Uh, after you have this stuff, uh, well, one thing to note is that we try to be friendly and provide you with some predefined profiles that you can already take into use out of the box and uh, which we're currently testing and uh, making sure that they're solid, right? Uh, but in reality, no size fits all and most likely than not, you're going to have to tailor your profile, which means change, add rules, remove rules. And so we have an abstraction called tailor profiles, right? and it, which allows you to do just that, right? In this case, uh, maybe you wanna throw a joke at somebody and put a silliness as permissive, please don't do that, but it's part of the example. And this is exactly what we're doing in this role. Uh, finally, as I mentioned before, we also wanna uh, configure the specific operational settings of your scanning, right? How much storage are you gonna put there? How often are you gonna uh, scan your hosts, right? In this case, it's every day at one in the morning. Uh, what roles for the nodes in your cluster are you going to scan, right? And all of this gets defined in the scan settings. We, all, we provide a default, but most likely than not, that will not be enough for your case. You will most likely have different roles or want a different rotation, rotation strategy. So you'll define it there. And with that in mind, Finally, what you want to do is specify your intent as with a lot of Kubernetes objects, right? So you want to say, for example, in this case, I want to comply with the essential aid profile. And that's it. You bind the settings to the profile. So in a way of saying, please scan my host with these specific profiles and the operator will just do it. Uh, the next thing you want to do is keep track, right? You want to see how the scans are doing. So we have an object called a compliance suite and it allows you to do that. Uh, it helps you keep track, like it will keep a face of where the scans are at, right? Is it done? Is it running? Is it aggregating the results? It, it helps you get events. So you could actually write a, a small service that listens for events when you have a result and do actions on that, right? Maybe you want to send a mail to your SRE, or maybe you want to just copy the results up to somewhere else, like off upload it, for example. So you could do such a thing. That's the intent. And finally, of course, we have objects for the results, right? Uh, one of them is going to be a remediation that you can apply, and the operator will help you do so. Uh, next, you're going to have the check results themselves with metadata about what happened. And finally, you'll have raw results, which are in a format that some auditors are used to seeing, right? So we store that in a persistent volume as well. I'm not gonna go through examples of this ones here, but you're gonna see a little bit of that in the demo. Uh, next is the how, Jacob. All right, so the how section tells how these scans are actually performed on the technical level. It sort of goes, goes up from the bottom, from the low level scans to the abstractions that Ross mentioned a while ago. Um, so before you have the scan, it needs to have some content. And the content is developed in this compliance code project uh, that it's compiled and the result of the compilation is XML file that's called data stream. Uh, the data stream is, is put into a container image and the container image is pushed to a registry. And while you can uh, you can reference all the low-level OpenScap objects in the compliance scan uh, API objects, it's very user unfriendly. So uh, there's this profile bundle object that we use to encapsulate the uh, OpenScap uh, data stream and the compliance uh, content and what comes out of this profile bundle objects are all these rules, profiles, and variables that uh, OS was showing earlier. And uh, the 
compliance operator on startup would create two kind of default profile bundle objects. Uh, one is for OCP, so for the Kubernetes cluster level, and one for uh, the nodes. And by default, we uh, we support Arcos. So by default, there's an OCP uh, profile bundle and a uh, Arcos profile bundle. These are meant for usability, so that it, instead of referencing to the uh, long OpenScape identifiers that nobody can be expected to remember or type, you just reference the objects like rules and profiles that are parts of these profile bundles just by name. Next slide, please. Okay, then the kind of the lowest level, uh, lowest object on the abstraction level is a compliance scan, which represents a single scan. And a single scan scans either the uh, Kubernetes API objects or a set of nodes. Typically, you would, say, you would scan a uh, a machine config pool because all the nodes in the machine config pool are the same. Um, the scan represents an kind of orchestrated open scan scan. So there's uh, scan reports that run actually open scan. They are fed the information through the content. Typically, you would do it by referencing the profiles and, and rules and whatnot. Then open scan itself runs and produces results. Uh, there's sort of two kinds of results that are produced, and we'll talk about that more in detail, but just briefly for now, there's sort of compact results uh, that just say if some rule passed or failed, and that can be used to uh, produce results as Kubernetes objects. And then there's a much bigger result, uh, actually a result file called ARF file, that auditors are normally used to, and that's too big to be stored in a CD as Kubernetes object. So it's offloaded to a persistent volume. And uh, how and why exactly we'll talk about later, I think, there in, in more detail. And uh, because, especially when you're scanning nodes, you would scan many nodes, but you want to represent the result for a set of nodes as a single result, right? You don't want to see 1,000 results for 1,000 nodes. So there's a pod called aggregator that looks at each of the compact results stored in config maps and aggregates them to a single result. So for each scan that scans a set of nodes in a machine config pool, you would end up seeing one result. Okay. Uh, there's two kinds of scans as we mentioned a couple of times before that you can either scan the nodes in the cluster or the uh, Kubernetes API objects. Uh, this distinction is represented as two types of scans. Uh, one is node and the other is a platform scan. The node scan uh, looks at the cluster nodes themselves. So typically that would be Arcos. How it works is that the pod that performs the scan is a privileged pod. It mounts the host file system at some known location uh, in the pod. And the OpenScap then runs sort of as, as it was scanning a root where the file system, uh, where the node file system is mounted. Um, and in this case, you would have one pod with OpenScap, one scanner pod per node in the cluster. And the platform scans is scanning the Kubernetes API objects. It scans just one singleton instance of the scanner pod that is not privileged because that bot doesn't have any business in mounting the uh, node file systems. It doesn't have to be. Uh, before actually doing this scan, the bot prefetches the Kubernetes API object that would be looking at like uh, config map secrets and whatnot, dumps them into a known location, and then runs the uh, open scan scanner on that known location. Okay, next slide, please. So this is what the scans do. They more or less wrap OpenScap uh, and perform the, the actual scans. One level up above the, the scans are the suites that I was mentioned before. So they provide, first they group together scans. So if you're scanning a kind of the typical default installation of OpenShift, you would have one, sc one scan for the master nodes. You would have another scan for the worker nodes. 
and then you would have a third scan for the uh, for the Kubernetes API objects. They would all be probably listed in one compliance suite. Uh, so the, there's the list of scans. Uh, the suite also exposes uh, aggregated status of all the scans. So uh, by aggregated, it means that if you have three scans, one of them is already done, the other two are running, uh, the aggregated scan will be displayed as running and not switched to done until all of them are done. And the suite also exposes kind of sugar around running the scans actually. So there's two things that are worth mentioning. One is a schedule. So you can, with the suite, you can say that the suite runs the scans periodically with a uh, Kubernetes cron job. And uh, the other thing is that in the suite, you can say that you want to just trust us and automatically apply all the remediations and kind of close all the gaps toward the compliance automatically. Uh, that might be useful, but probably should be used only once you verify that all of the settings are actually okay in your environment. Okay, and then going up from the scan and the suite is the scan setting binding. So that's a abstraction that lets you generate the suite and the scans without actually having to type out all the uh, open scan details. So instead of typing the identifiers that OpenScape expects, that would be like XCCDF underscore something underscore Arcos and so on. You can just say, I want to scan uh, these, this group of machines using the Arcos FedRAMP moderate profile. And the scan setting binding would generate the compliance suite for you. And the compliance suite would then generate the scans for you and sort of goes all like this. And as I said earlier, that some profile bundles are created by default. So in the easiest case, you can just reference the objects that are already there for you. You don't have to set anything. Next slide, please, now. OK, and uh, a little more. The lights keep getting off here. Just probably disable the camera for a bit. So as we said a bit before, there's uh, Two kinds of results. There's the compact results uh, that are small enough to be put into a CD. And there's the raw results that are stored in this format called ARF. Uh, I think it means assessment result format. These results are very often required by auditors, or at least the auditors are used to them. And there exist a, some third party tools that visualize and correlate the results and so on. Uh, the ARF result, while useful, uh, is huge. It's uh, like think tens or even hundreds of megabytes big XML file. So this is too big to put in a CD into config map or any other native Kubernetes object. It's need to be stored somewhere else. Uh, what we did was that uh, once the result, uh, once the ARF test result is created, the scanner pods upload the uh, the results into a persistent volume. So as a user, what you would do is you would then spawn a pod that mounts the persistent volume once, once the scan is done and copy the results somewhere else for uh, viewing in some third party tool that, that you might have. All right. So, with all that said and done, now we can try it out. Now, uh, we're not going to do a live demo, even though this is a live session. <laughs> so this time we're actually have a recording for that, right? So uh, let me try to copy it here. Oh, I could not copy it there. Yeah, there you go. You could see it. So, oh, I messed it up. Hmm. Let me try to uh, do this right. Right. Hopefully, folks can see the whole thing. But uh, okay, as kinema has been a little difficult, but okay, we can see some things, right? So the first thing that you already see is that uh, 
uh, we have some profiles that already come with the installation of the operator. So what we're going to do is check out one of those profiles, right? Uh, this one is the essential eight one. Uh, there are some extra fields that come from kubectl, but that's just what you get. Oh, is it possible to make it larger? Okay, let me give that a try. I can give that a try. Wait up. I think uh, I could do that larger, but I would need to switch to the other screen. Yeah, I'm going to try to switch to the other screen, and uh, hopefully that helps. Allow. So then I'm gonna switch this one to my other screen over here. There you go. And let's give this a try. Right, uh, what about this? Is this any better? The font could be bigger. Yeah, I guess. What about this, though? Right. Maybe we can continue with this one. Right. So the stuff that you already saw, some profiles that are already there. Not much difference. All right. Well, that's that's a bummer. Uh, so in this case, I'm just checking out the profile. As you can see, there's a bunch of rules that are enabled in this profile. Uh, the next thing to do, though, uh, is, well, check out one of the rules, right, just out of curiosity. In this case, we're going to set the uh, K pointer restrict from the sys controls in the kernel. And uh, it gives you some metadata, as I mentioned about it, like the rationale, or uh, there was a fix enabled over there. And, uh, yeah. Let's try to take it into use. Uh, first thing that we want, though, is to put some settings for that, right? In this case, we're just going to allocate one gigabyte for the storage. Uh, it's a very small cluster. In bigger clusters, of course, you would need a lot more. And there is guidance for that. And we're just going to run this every day at 1 in the morning, right, for workers and masters. Uh, finally, we just apply, right? We want to comply with uh, the E8 profile and with my settings. And let's just do let the operator do its thing, right? Which is exactly what it's doing, right? It's going to be running the profile. And uh, until we get a result, it's going to be in state running. And then it's finally aggregating the result, which means that it goes through all of the nodes in the cluster, check the results. Do I have inconsistencies or not? Or is everything A-OK? -okay? And finally, after aggregating the profile, we should see a result fairly soon. Right. Uh, so in this case, of course, this was an out-of-the-box uh, cluster. So it was not, com not compliant, unfortunately. And uh, we can see what exactly failed, right? In this case, there's a lot of audit rules that were not set, and they're not default. So those can be easily fixed. Uh, there were some SSHD parameters as well that were missing, uh, but that's a lot of them. We can also uh, actually just check the failed results with a label, which makes life a little bit easier. Uh, and you can also view the results and it'll tell you more or less, like, is this uh, a bad thing, right? How bad of it is it? It's like medium, high uh, severity, and a little bit more metadata about it. Uh, in this case, we're also checking the remediations. None of them have been applied, but uh, in this case, uh, the remediation was a machine config. As I mentioned, the machine config is a OpenShift-specific thing that allows you to configure the operating system. And uh, yeah, so we just try to apply it. And as you can see, the machine config object got uh, created. Uh, and uh, that's about it related to uh, 
remediations, right? So here was the creation. Uh, you can see machine config object in there. And finally, we want the raw results, right? So those are, they have persistent volume claims in the cluster. One thing that we can do is create another pod to fetch them, or actually I have another utility to make that a little bit easier. But, uh, but yeah, this is just the basic flow of what you would do in your day-to-day -day when you're running the operator. I'm sorry it went a little fast. Uh, it was a little difficult given that I could not uh, maximize this. But yeah, so, so that's it over there. Uh, now we're going to talk about some challenges about the building the operator itself. Um, one of them, as mentioned, was the result server. Uh, which is the server that actually fetches all of the raw results. And the issue was that initially we were not aware that etcd had that limit because we were new to that. So we had to write it to, to begin with, right? And so then we came to the issue that not all of the default volume types uh, accept read, write many. Right, a lot of them, for example, in Amazon, the default is read write once, which will only allow you to mount one volume per node at a time, right? So that got a little bit tricky. So you gotta be careful when using that one. Uh, therefore, that's why we needed just one result server as opposed to just writing to a shared volume in all of the nodes that are doing the scan. That would have been way easier, but that wasn't possible at the time. Uh, another thing is that now that we actually push the results towards a single result server, uh, we have to do it securely, right? Because these are potential security findings. So we do have an ephemeral PKI that's created just for each scan. So you can only get and receive results from the nodes that belong to that scan, from the pods, sorry. Right, so, so that was another thing that we did. Uh, Jacob will explain the next challenge though. Right, so as I alluded, when you're scanning the nodes, you might be potentially scanning hundreds or thousands of nodes, but you want the result to be represented as a single object, right? Uh, that sort of assumes that all the nodes would have identical results, which should be the case. Normally, you would scan a um, nodes in the single machine config pool, which should be identical, but there you might not be. Uh, so what if one of the nodes is different? Um, if, next slide, please. Uh, if one of the nodes is different, it might be because the admin just did you know, OC debug or SSH into the node and just ran VI and changed a file. Or it might be worse, it might be a breaking attempt. Either way, what we want to do is we want to direct the attention of the admin or the compliance officer who's running the scan to this issue and make them aware. So in this case, uh, regardless of whether we can move on from this state to a compliant, we always flag the result as uh, inconsistent. And because there can be many notes and we want to make it easy to find where the inconsistency is, we also try to find the most common state among the nodes and just flag the inconsistencies. Uh, this is all visible as Kubernetes labels. I forgot the exact names, but it's it's in the docs. So once you get the full set of results, you can just uh, filter by labels and see, okay, this node is different from the others and this result is consistent and so on. Um, finding the most common state is not always possible, like what happens if you have just two nodes, right? And one of them has this state and the other has the other. So, uh, but if it's possible, we try to find the common state. And if possible, we try to make it possible, we, we try to make it so that you can converge from that inconsistent state by applying the remediation. That's also not always possible. Like if in case uh, one of the nodes skips the check completely, we have no idea what, what its state is. But if it's possible, we always try to generate the remediation. And once a you apply the remediations, you would get to the consistent state. Okay, the other issue we were dealing with was with uh, contents updates. Uh, so the remediations, as you maybe saw in the demo, are 
stored as Kubernetes objects for the node updates, there will be uh, machine config objects. And uh, while you can patch the object, like calling OC patch or kubectl patch, uh, this still replaces the whole thing. So the whole machine config or a whole uh, config map. Um, so with the machine config, this means the whole file is, is replaced. Uh, but what if the remediation needs to be updated? Like we messed up the remediations, we actually need to set some other contents of the file or the file, the, the package that we uh, set configuration for has been updated, rebased, and its default have changed. In that case, we need to push out a new remediation. Um, because it's probably not a good, a good idea to just do this automatically and not that, let the admin know. What we do is, in this case, the remediation object that was previously up, applied is flagged as outdated. And in the in the object, like if you dump it with OC get YAML, uh, you would see both the current object that is applied to the cluster now. So that represents maybe the file contents on the disk and uh, the new version of the remediation. And this gives you the opportunity to uh, review and revisit the, the object and apply the new settings at kind of your own pace once the contents have been vetted, tested, whatnot. Okay, uh, when is this going to be released? Um, the operator will be part of OpenShift 4.6. Um, as far as like, Red Hat OpenShift goes, this will be uh, released on operator the hub as many other operators. Uh, but the important thing to note is that that's the operator. It doesn't mean that we will release all the content and you know people will be able to make their clusters compliant immediately with all the different security standards. The content will come a bit later and uh, the content releases are designed or we work so that the content releases can be asynchronous and not depend on the uh, OpenShift schedule or you know, operator schedule. They're completely decoupled. And uh, in 4.6, as far as the nodes go, nodes go at least uh, only Argos would be supported. typical issue from right now. So uh, now we're going to go through some frequently asked questions uh, that we have gotten over the time while developing this operator. Uh, the first one has been, uh, why are you using OpenSCAP and compliance as code? That is old technology and so on. But in reality, I mean, it's a standard and it's something that people already have tooling and automation on top of, right? Uh, more so, there are auditors that already have uh, setups that allow them to easily browse and consume uh, results and uh, checklists out of this, right? So it, let's just make life easier for both the people in the field uh, and for us because there's already something up there, right? Another thing is that they already have a community, right? So it is not actually just used for RHEL. There are There is content for Ubuntu, there is content for macOS. Uh, there are other projects, not just OpenShift, like OpenStack, for example, that has security content here. So we, we want to enable communities and enhance communities. So that's why we decided, hey, let's tag along in this project and uh, take it into use, right? Hopefully at some point be able to provide more value as well. So uh, another question that we have gotten quite often is why didn't you use OPA or Open Policy Agent, uh, which is a project from the CNCF. And the fact is that even though OPA and the compliance operator both evaluate policy, they're very different projects, right? The Open Policy Agent is a policy engine. So it allows you to, in an abstract manner, evaluate policy that most likely than not, is you're gonna use in Kubernetes for your uh, admission controllers, right? So you're gonna be able to do authorization decisions the compliance operator uh, evaluates compliance policy, which is very different. 
Right. So what we want to do is, do I comply with this framework and give me a result about it and help me get there? Right. So in reality, they're quite different projects. And we do see a world where the compliance operator could check that certain rules that OPA expects are present in the cluster and thus allow you to comply using those rules. Right. So we view them as projects that can coexist, converge and give mutual value right they're not visually exclusive although and we do different things we also have gotten a lot of questions about can we use this in more previous versions right like for that three and unfortunately the answer is no right due to uh, one the testing due to the bandwidth that we have but three is just that we are using a little bit newer apis that didn't exist in for that three so that's uh, unfortunately not going to be possible uh, what about RHEL? Uh, even though uh, the design that we have is fairly generic and you could possibly run content for RHEL, uh, again, the fact is that mostly we've done, we've done testing in CoreOS, right? So that is what we're supporting. And finally, uh, does the compliance operator make us compliant? And the answer again is no, right? Uh, while there's a lot of stuff that you can automate uh, with the compliance operator, uh, as Jacob mentioned, uh, some content is still being created. And even when we have that content ready, the fact is that there are things that you're going to have to do by yourself. For example, we cannot force you to use a specific identity provider and to enable two-factor authentication in that identity provider, right? That's up to you, right? Uh, that's just one example, but there's many more. Uh, and so there is more to it than just an operator for compliance. Right. And uh, what's next? Uh, there is still a lot of work to do, uh, mostly content, though. So we are going to be very busy writing content. Uh, we are looking into the CIS benchmark. We are looking for more content for FedRAMP. And there are more profiles out there. So we're going to be doing a lot of that. Uh, another one is that we are working a lot with the uh, advanced cluster management team, right? So to enable the compliance operator there. So we already are able to uh create policies with rackham that will trigger policies from the compliance operator right so and give results to rackham right so you are able to say i want all of my managed clusters to be uh, uh essential aid compliant and uh, you'll get results for it that is possible but uh it is not very granular right so it'll tell you pass or fail but it won't tell you exactly what are all the checks that failed and that's something that we're working on, right? So that'll come in the future. And finally, we want to be also deployed by default by Rackham, which would be great, but we're not there yet. And uh, that's it. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Thanks a lot for joining our talk. I'm sorry if it, the demo got a little messy, but uh, we really appreciate you folks getting interested in this. Thank you so much. We're going to stick around for the questions, though, if there's any. that we do have a question right now for from David Duncan. Uh, do we have any specific compliance targets in mind uh, for the first support? Right. And uh, we are going to be looking into uh, CIS and FedRAMP. Right. Uh, FedRAMP is a huge, huge uh, compliance benchmark. So that'll take a while. But uh, CIS is not as much. So that's what we're going to be looking at first. Uh, unfortunately, that's not going to be available in the first first release. But as we mentioned in the presentation, you can get updates out of band for your content, right? So at any time that there's newer content, you can just fetch it with the operator 
and uh, that'll that'll just come. It, it'll be fairly seamless to that extent. So, um, let's keep my hand on time. I think we don't have too much time left. There is a link to a breakout room where we can continue the discussion if more sure. Q&A questions come up. So, um, or you can continue discussing in the Stripe chat as well, uh, which one you prefer. Um, again, thanks a ton for your time, folks. Um, this is really interesting stuff.